The 1981 New York Jets highlight is brought to you by Kodak, America's storyteller. In 1981, a special kind of excitement stalked New York City. It was provided by a bold young football team that captured the imagination of a town that thrives on conquering heroes. This team possessed determination, confidence, and flair. They were the Jets, New York's team and they soared to great heights. By posting a 10-5-1 record that gave the franchise its first winning season since 1969, they recalled the glory days of Eubank and Namath. But this Jet Squad sought to establish an identity for the present. I would like uh, everybody to think of us as a winning team now. You know, you can live on the past, but not, not 10, 11 years. I mean, I, th I think we should give something to, for the people to talk about now, right now. A daffy delirium called Jet Fever caught New Yorkers with their pants down. No one wanted to be cured, and when the Jets clinched their first playoff berth in 13 years by beating Green Bay on the season's final weekend, Jet fever reached epidemic proportions. We talked about all week, what does this team got to do? It's got to make the big play right now. Let's go. Ready? Fight! Todd rolls to the right, back to pass. He is throwing deep for Lamb. He has it at the 50. That fight is down. In 1981, everybody was talking about the team that won the heart of a towering town. A team wears many faces each representing a unique personality. All of these personalities share a common goal, to wear the look of a winner. But that look eluded the Jets in the season's first three weeks. After consecutive losses to Buffalo, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh, the face of adversity stared at Walt Michael's squad. Many feared that team confidence would be crippled, but the Jets came right out of the chute and showed they were very healthy indeed when they beat Houston at Shea Stadium in week four. The Oilers were upended by a defense that forced six turnovers, registered a safety, and recorded eight sacks. A 33-17 victory was also paced by Richard Todd's three touchdown passes. The following week in Miami, Todd's four scoring passes included a spectacular catch by Bobby Jones. A 28-28 overtime tie blemished the Dolphins' then unbeaten record and bolstered the Jets' belief in themselves. Week six and seven brought home victories over New England and Buffalo. The offense and punter Chuck Ramsey helped beat the Patriots. Four straight weeks without a loss marked a turnaround that secured team unity and produced a confident outlook. People have, you know, come up against the Jets and considered it a win without even going out to play the game in the past. And they can't do that anymore. You know, we're a team to be reckoned with, and it makes it fun to play. 
Joe Klecko's unbridled energy allows him to stand tall among the human skyscrapers who dominate his position. I'm short, really. Most defensive ends in the league are an average of 6'5 and over. When them big guys come out there and look at that little guy out there they're going to play against, you know, they kind of chuckle a little. <laughs> but Klecko had the last laugh as his 20 and a half quarterback sacks were an NFL high in 1981. His strength turned pass blockers into minor annoyances. Klecko made the Pro Bowl and attained superstar status as well as cult status among jet-fevered fans who appreciated his rough and tumble style. That same style was displayed by tackle Marty Lines, number 93, who was quick to stifle the run and also recorded six sacks. Tackle Abdul Salam, number 74, earned seven sacks. Mark Gastineau, number 99, rounded out the unit that became known as the New York Sack Exchange. His agility and strength earned him a Pro Bowl selection and 20 sacks, second best to Klecko among NFL pass rushers. His emotions earned him a frenzied following among fans. The sack exchange established a raging bull market for sacks. Their total of 66 was just one shy of an NFL record. The defense was also ignited by linebackers Greg Butto, Stan Blinker, Ron Crosby, and number 56, Lance Mel, the team's leading tackler. Mel brought lofty hopes of running against the Jets down to earth. The furious pursuit of Buttle number 51 helped the sack exchange to thrive. Enemy offenses were further frustrated by a secondary that included Johnny Lynn number 29. Lynn's last second interception against New England preserved a 28-24 victory. Jerry Holmes number 47 also made his presence felt. Despite an injury to defensive co-captain Bobby Jackson, the secondary was consistent, as performers like number 48 Ken Troy forced quarterbacks to operate in a vacuum. The secondary's premier theft artist was free safety Darrell Ray, number 28, whose seven interceptions included two touchdowns. In only his second pro season, Ray became the Jets' all-time interception return yardage leader. In 1981, the Jets were the AFC's best defensive unit. And in week nine, they established themselves as the best in New York City. The shadow of the city's pro football tradition loomed over the Meadowlands site of the first Jets-Giants regular season battle since 1974. The Giants' offense was repelled by brute force. Pat Lay personally accounted for 14 points in the 26-7 victory including four field goals in four attempts. The game's lone offensive touchdown came when Todd connected with number 85, Wesley Walker. Jet fever had spread across the Hudson, and Giant fans suffered an adverse reaction. Defense dealt them the final blow. Back the pass goes Sims. Has time, fires, intercepted by Ray at the 40. He's at the midfield. He's at the 40. The 30, Sims, the only man who can get him. He cuts back inside. Sims trips him up, but Ray's still on his feet to the end zone. Touchdown! Touchdown, Darrell Ray! He intercepted it, broke tackles, went to the end zone, some 60 yards, and the Jets are going to beat the Giants. 
the win even the Jets' record at 4-4-1 and, and entitled them to be the talk of the town. Trouble always pops up for the Jets when they play the Seattle Seahawks. Their only two losses over the last 13 weeks of 1981 came at the hands of Seattle. But during this 13-week period, the Jets managed to find the handle against everyone else. They maintained a firm grasp on AFC East Foles with a 6-1-1 one one mark that was the division's best. The unpredictable bounces of the football helped the Jets seize their own destiny and run away with a 10-2-1 record over a 13-week stretch. No AFC team did better. But chance had little to do with the success achieved by the Jets' offense. And success began with an imposing line. In his 15th season as starting guard, Randy Rasmussen set an all-time club record for games played. Center Joe Fields was named to the Pro Bowl for his ability to protect the quarterback in any type of situation. Fields, Chris Ward, Dan Alexander, and third-time Pro Bowl selection Marvin Powell, number 79, paved the way for the AFC's third-best rushing attack. Number 42, Bruce Harper, danced his way to over five yards per carry and four scores. His elusive style was counterpointed by the straight-ahead power of fullbacks Tom Newton, Mike Augustiniak, and Kevin Long, number 33. Number one draft choice, Freeman McNeil, number 24, led the team in rushing, despite a foot injury that limited his playing time. When healthy, McNeil offered a clinic on how to burn defenses. A crash course on how to bruise them was conducted by number 25, Scott Durkin. Durkin was adept at navigating his way through heavy traffic. These versatile backs excelled as receivers too and kept defenses off balance by accounting for over half of the Jets' completions. But the team's passing game had a more wide-open dimension, thanks to Wesley Walker's return to form. Walker sought to bask in the limelight after two straight injury-plagued seasons, while Richard Todd was determined to make good on the potential he had never quite completely fulfilled. The quarterback and the wide receiver. Both had something to prove, and prove it they did. Todd's 25 touchdown passes included three or more in five different games. With a career-high nine touchdowns, Walker was what he's always been, pure poetry in motion. Todd became a textbook passer and carved a new chapter in his career. After leading the NFL in interceptions with 30 in 1980, he threw just 13 while boldly seeking out deep threats, Walker and Lamb Jones number eight. Jones hit his stride down the stretch run to the playoffs and was Todd's fastest target. The tallest target was Jerome Barkham number 83. The six foot four tight ends, seven touchdowns, were the most in a distinguished career that began 10 years ago.
This core of talented receivers, including Derek Gaffney and Bobby Jones, enabled Todd to compile impressive statistics. But there was more to his resurgence than numbers. There was also courage. And courage allowed him to banish the clouds of concern about his ability to lead the Jets from behind. In week 12, Todd played against first place Miami despite cracked ribs and a sprained foot. Four sacks intensified his pain. But with the Jets trailing and only three minutes left to play, Todd began a masterful 77-yard scoring drive in which he hit seven different receivers. The stage was set for a climax worthy of a Saturday matinee at the Bijou. These fans are on their feet. 21 seconds remaining as Todd is back to pass. He's looking into the end zone. Oh, oh, Richard Todd had brought the Jets into the division lead. The promised land of the playoffs lay ahead. The Jets forged a trail of excellence throughout November and December. But a loss to Green Bay in the season's final game could bring a dead end. On the line was a playoff berth. The sack exchange stopped the Packers' potent passing game by dumping Lynn Dickey nine times. Just keep holding, we're gonna score. Come on, Richard, take him in, baby, come on! Todd's 47-yard strike to Lamb Jones was the first of two bombs that keyed a 28-3 victory. Todd, back to pass, throw it deep to Wesley, all allowed, he has a touchdown! Wesley Walker on play New York had its first playoff team since the 1969 Jets. By embracing the principles of patience and hard work, Walt Michaels had instilled the Jets with a winning habit. After so much sacrifice and so much work and preparation, man, it's great. I tell you, I've never been in the, in the playoffs before. I never played on a team that was over 500. Really? It's, yeah, and, and it's good feeling. Can't believe it. After all those years of just finishing out the season, to finally have you know to finally know the season's over and you got at least one more game. A misty, rainy afternoon at Shea provided the backdrop for a game that no football fan will ever forget. This playoff game was a culmination of a dream come true season, but it began as a terrifying nightmare. When Bruce Harper was stripped to the ball on the opening kickoff, Buffalo produced the first of three unanswered touchdowns. Midway through the second quarter, the Bills held a seemingly insurmountable lead. But the Jets were well-schooled in overcoming adversity, and as the first half drew to a close, Todd's touchdown pass to Mickey Shuler began a spectacular climb back. In the second half, the Bills produced an early touchdown that increased their lead to 31-13. But the undaunted Jets responded with a series of counter punches that wore the Bills down. In the final period, the Jets cut the deficit to four points by scoring two touchdowns, including a 30-yard reception by Bobby Joe. This duel in grime and grit also saw the defense lend a hand to the comeback effort. The crowd lent its voice. Defense! 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 The 
though hobbled by a bad ankle, Joe Klecko led a tenacious pass rush that bogged down the Bills. And Greg Buttle's second interception of the game was one of three second-half jet thefts. With 2.36 left to play, the Jets began the drive that people will talk about for as long as the imagination is stirred by courage and determination. Todd led the Jets from their own 20 to the Buffalo 11, and Shea Stadium rocked with anticipation. There is nobody in this ballpark who is seated. They are all standing. They are watching the conclusion of one of the most exciting ball games I have ever seen. The Jets trail 31, 27, 10 seconds remaining. The season riding right here, third in the season. But in a sudden instant that seemed like an eternity, it all came to an end. Todd looks toward the end zone and gap, even the ball is intercepted. The season is over. The Buffalo Bills, Bill Simpson, has intercepted at the two-yard line. It's going to end here. And a dejected Richard Todd leaves the field. He nearly pulled the miracle off, nearly pulled his team back from a 24 to nothing deficit. It was not a day for merits, but it was a day for proving that defeat with honor is more than an empty cliche. This loss may have bent the Jets, but it could not break what was achieved during a shining season. In 1981, the New York Jets emerged as one of the most colorful and talented teams of the NFL's new era. They were winners, and their pride and enthusiasm were shared by the town that thrives on conquering heroes. The Jets, New York's team, a young and exciting team that promises to be the talk of the town for a long time to come. The game is on the line, and all eyes focus on the quarterback. The snap suddenly shatters the quiet, and NFL Films documents every moment, every game-deciding play. For over 15 years, NFL Films has been the third team at every game. Each season, over 420 miles of film are shot, and the results are the world's finest sports cinematography and six Emmy Awards. With editing, music, and scripting, each film becomes a unique portrait, and only the very best become NFL Films' video cassettes. The thrilling Super Bowl series, team highlights, historical masterpieces, memorable games. From OJ to Doomsday, it's all captured on cassette. Why not sample the sophisticated humor of the Festival of Funny? Hi, Mom! 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 For the truly wacky, how about our award-winning football folly? Although each man is a specialist in pro football, one man stands above the rest. Stands. Stands. You're supposed to stand. Somebody. Anybody. That's the quarterback often referred to as the two-bit back, or the back only worth two bits. What the hell's going on out here? 
Everybody's grabbing out there. Nobody tackling. Just grabbing, everybody. Grab, grab, grab. Nobody tackling. The NFL's best ever coaches and the best ever quarterbacks. Just two in our new best ever series that, like all of our specially priced tapes, are available in VHS and Beta 2 formats. The best ever teams, professionals, and runners round out the new series. So get in on all the action in the comfort of your own living room. Relive the mighty men and the magic moments over and over again on NFL Films video cassettes. The trials that reveal the measure of men like Jim Marshall's wrong way run are revealed in the best ever professionals. Franco Harris's immaculate reception made the Steelers a team of destiny. His heroic moment comes to life once more in the Super 70s. Tommy Kramer's last second prayer was answered in the miracle at the Met, and the play lives on in Saviors, Saints, and Sinners, the story of the 1980 season. When O.J. Simpson was the first to gain 2,000 yards in a season, he became a legend. His 2,000-yard odyssey is retraced in the NFL's inspirational men and moments. NFL Films Video Cassettes, the state of the art in home sports entertainment.